This is Jenny Frankfurt, and you're watching the TV Writer Podcast. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web. My name is Gray Jones, and I want to welcome you to the TV Writer Podcast, episode 66. And today's interview is with literary manager and producer Jenny Frankfurt. You're going to love the interview. Actually, only the second manager we've had on the podcast. Lots of great tips and information. Did you know that prostate cancer is the number two killer of men? You may have noticed something growing on my face. I am sporting a mo right now, and that is for Movember to raise awareness of men's health and specifically prostate cancer. Uh, it's particularly appropriate today, November 16th, as I'm recording this podcast. My dad actually would have turned 69 today, but because of cancer, I lost him in 2000. He died at the age of 56. And for anybody, that's way too early. You can find out more about this cause at movember.com. Specifically, I would invite you to go to ca.movember.com slash mospace slash 487-1793. That's my own personal Movember page. If you had a few bucks to give a, a donation, it goes to a great cause. Let's reduce the numbers of people who are affected by prostate cancer. And in particularly, if there are men in your life, and I'm guaranteeing that there are, and if you're a man right now, you know, my dad was in the in his 40s when he got cancer. It's never too early to get checked. So let's make sure to put aside our pride and get checked for this. Urge the men in your life to do so because it is the number two killer of men. On to some great writing resources, which of course are at tvwriterpodcast.com. There's interviews with 66 plus writers in the podcasts there. There's links to hundreds of free TV scripts, pilots, and Bibles. There's a Twitter database with over 960 writers that continues to climb. You can, of course, follow me on Twitter at Gray Jones, and you can find out all those, all those resources at the website tvwriterpodcast.com. As well, you can find me on IMDb, imdb.me slash Gray Jones, if you want to find out a little bit more about what I do. You can go to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Graham A. Jones is how you get there. And in particular, I just posted a playlist of tons of great interviews with John Truby. You really have to check those out, especially if you're trying to break in awesome, awesome stuff. And as well, there's a Facebook group for the TV Writer Podcast. Facebook.com slash TV Writer Podcast can't get easier than that. Anyway, on to my interview with literary manager, producer Jenny Frankfurt. You're going to love it. All about management. Let's roll. This is Gray, and I'm here with literary manager and producer Jenny Frankfurt. How are you doing, Jenny? Very well, Gray. How are you? I'm doing really well, thanks. And I appreciate you coming on. We've actually only had one other manager on the podcast in about 66 episodes. So it's wow. great great to hear your side of the fence, so to speak. Yes. And uh, now you, you weren't always a, a liter literary manager, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But uh, you've, you've had a pretty good career, 20, 20 years roughly, representing some pretty big names. Yes, yeah. I started off in representation in the agencies mm -hmm. and um, eventually decided I wanted to work more closely with the clients mm -hmm. um, and became a manager instead of an agent. But I did spend quite a bit of time both in New York and Los Angeles uh, training at both um, William Morris mm -hmm. and uh, ICM. Very cool. And you had studied at, at uh, NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. At, what was it you were thinking at that point that you wanted to do? Well, I, you know, actually, this is horrible to say because college is a very important place, but um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I pretty much knew that I wasn't going to finish uh, college when I started college. I knew what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, I knew that I wanted to do something along these lines of what I'm doing now. And I kind of went to, you know, to have some of the experience and to to stay in New York at the time. Um, but halfway through my college education, I actually got a job at William Morris. Wow. So that that uh, pretty much took care of that. <laughs> pretty much took care of college. <laughs> yeah, very cool. And, and actually, yeah. while you were there, you, you represented um, some playwrights as well. Is that true? 
Yeah, that's right. I worked. What I did uh, was I I, I I was hired as a floater at William Morris, which mm-hmm. is pretty much, I guess you would call a temp now, where you know where you just go where you're needed, really. And um, I made a, a lot. Uh, I mean, it was one of the best experiences in hindsight that I could have because I I learned about contracts. I learned about music, uh, you know, contracts, uh, which I would I would eventually need to know at one point in my life. Um, I learned about riders and and all different kinds of things. Um, you know, some days weren't as as, as exciting certainly, but um, you know, I, I met a lot of people. And uh, my first the first desk that finally opened up. Um, after I had floated around for a while, was uh, for George Lane, who was the head of the uh, of the literary department there, mm-hmm. of, the, of the playwriting department, theater department rather. And yeah, we work with playwrights, and uh, the great, great thing that I learned there, which I have taken with me into my career, was that he, you know, he said, "Listen, I know that playwriting is your love, and playwriting is my love." And theater is my love, but I can't make money off of off of plays, uh-huh. you know. And you have to do something else to make money for me to be able to uh, be able to represent you. Mm-hmm. So we had amazing people uh, who are now, you know, who, who do who are still playwrights, but um, you know, Warren Light, who runs um, Law and Order SVU now, mm-hmm. and who won a Tony a couple of years ago for Sideman, Brian Galyuboff, who was was on SVU and um, is now now on Smash I think uh, on you know writing uh, and producing um, who was a uh, you know a playwright um, Bill Master Simone who wrote Extremities and uh, you know on and on and on Eric Bogosian and John Robin Bates and all these people who have had huge careers in television and in film mm. as well as retaining really strong ties to the theater. So I learned there that this was a business mm. um, and not just, you know, a place where you got to uh, help people get their dreams made <laughs> uh, true, <laughs> like yeah. getting their uh, their plays, uh, you know, produced, but that, um, you know, that there had to be a business behind it and that you had to have boundaries and you had to have rules mm. um, about how you were going to represent people. And I learned a lot from George. Yeah. And I learned a lot from the playwrights. Obviously, it was a great, a great time in New York to be representing incredible playwrights all over the place. So that mm. was exciting. Well, and speaking about business, obviously, you did learn that lesson because you you yeah. went to ICM and worked with such uh, people as Susan Sarandon, Johnny Depp, Will Smith. I mean, really big yeah. names now, um, yep. and were back then too. Uh, but yeah. so so tell me about that phase and what what you learned coming to Los Angeles. Yeah, well, actually, interestingly, and just just so you know that this is a business about who you know, I actually came to Los Angeles on the tail of having um, temped for somebody at I at the at, at William Morris when mm-hmm. I was floating, um, <laughs> and that brought that helped bring me to Los Angeles. That move, so it really helps to make contacts. That's mm. what this business is about. I uh, I came to Los Angeles. I went to work at ICM because somebody who I had been working with at William Morris had crossed over and was now uh, an agent at ICM, and she helped me get a job. Um, so I was very lucky. I was set up. By the time I moved here, I was I had a job, hmm. um, which is very rare. Yeah. Um, I mean, I had to come out and uh, get the job, but I you know was able to go back to New York and pack up and come back out. So. Yeah, I I started off. I was a trainee, and uh, so I was on the agent training track, and I worked primarily with uh, filmmakers now mm-hmm. and actors um, in in the desks that I worked on, and I, I worked for two agents or three agents there mm-hmm. while I was at ICM. Primarily Martha Luttrell and uh, Tracy Jacobs, who's now one of the uh, partners over at UTA mm-hmm. and some uh, David Goldman who is a manager now uh, who used to represent Will Smith um, mm-hmm. yeah it was big I mean it was big time it was a time when people like Johnny Depp were big stars but not 
as big as they are now, even, mm. you know, I mean, he had just finished, I'm going to date myself here, but he was, he had just finished Gilbert Grape. Mm. And he was exploding, yeah. but he was, you know, he wasn't Pirates of the you know Caribbean yeah. stage. And uh, he would come and sit in the office all day, that kind of thing. <laughs> he didn't have, he was one of those actors, he didn't have anything to do, he'd just come and sit in the office. So uh, uh, I used to hang with Johnny Depp a lot. You know, Susan Sarandon at that stage, uh, was, you know, just sort of a huge, huge actress. You know, mm. she, she was sort of in her prime. Yeah. And winning her Oscar, I think, while I was there. Kathleen Turner, I worked with, um, who was also in her prime at that mm. time. Yeah. And then incredible filmmakers like Martin Campbell, who was kind of not even, uh, you know, hardly Martin Campbell, you know, the Martin Campbell who's done a few Bond films and big, action films now he was uh you know he was trying to break america um mm -hmm. at that stage and he did obviously uh louis mall you know the great louis mall who passed away the great filmmaker mm -hmm. french filmmaker just people like that and had a great experience with being able to and john emil who you know um who was a great uh british filmmaker who were, you know, sort of bridging the gap. A lot of Australian, Judy Davis, a lot of Australian, British, uh, American, you know, people kind of, yeah, at the, at the top of their game. Mm -hmm. And it gave me an insight into working, uh, with not a lot of writers, to be honest, mm -hmm. um, but working with directors, which I continued to do and, with actors, which I did continue to do and eventually stopped. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, so, a whole so, other story. <laughs> yeah, well, let's let's talk about that time a little bit. So, so you were kind yeah. of at a fork in the road, and and certainly, I mean, you'd been exposed enough. You you could have just gone for being an agent, and there was something about management that attracted you. It, tell me about that. Well, what happened at that stage actually was that I actually left. Uh, representation for good for a while because the politics of the company had gotten mm -hmm. just too extreme and it was going to take me too long at this stage to become an agent and I wanted to kind of check check out other things and, and at that stage I actually went and worked on a client's film Fred Skepsi who was a well-known Australian uh, director mm -hmm. who, who directed uh, Meryl Streep and Cry in the Dark and um, I mean, I went and worked on a film with him, with Meg Ryan and Tim Robbins, to see just what it was like to see a film being made. I think that that's an important thing to do um, mm -hmm. when you're, you know, just whoever you are out there. Um, try different things, you know. I mean, I, you know, I was on the set of the film for two months, and now I know exactly what happens, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. A lot of people go into this business and they don't have any idea about what the creative aspects of it are. Mm -hmm. it, it was a great experience. I mean, it was one that I, can, I chose not to continue with. I realized that physical production wasn't really what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. um, but I've done it, you know, and I've seen it. And I've done it with big movie stars and I've seen how that goes and I've seen just, you know, how it's done on a day-to-day -day basis of having getting a film made. So... I think it's important that you spread your wings a little bit if you have the opportunity and get get a bite of as much as you can in this business and not not only know your own corner of it. Absolutely, absolutely. So so you did you you did that experience and but it wasn't something that you No, I, I decided I didn't want to continue, you know, in that in that direction at that time and I came back and uh I I missed representation. Representation has always been something that has just felt comfortable to me. It's something I know that I'm good at. It's mm -hmm. something that feels feels just, you know, like the right thing for me to be doing. So I got a job um, actually at a, f a friend of mine was an, a manager at a company called Evolution, mm -hmm. which is a huge, a huge management company now. They've done all the Saw movies and much, much, much more than that. But uh, they, they established a strong production arm and, and that's sort of how they uh, they built themselves, uh, you know, up on, in a big way. Mm -hmm. And the head of the company needed uh, an assistant. And I thought, oh, God, I've done this already for so long. <laughs> do I have to do this again? Yeah. But it was the head of the company. And, yeah. you know, I thought, well, this could be interesting. You know, I mean, then what, what do I expect? I don't have any clients. I might as well take what I can get, and, mm -hmm. you know, see what I can learn here and so on and so forth. And let me also just start by saying if you're a writer or if you're 
somebody who wants to be a manager or in representation, it can take a long time. Mm. It can take a short time. And the business is very different than it used to now than it used to be. Mm-hmm. There's always a lot of politics, just so you know. And agencies are very hard to move up in. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. And it takes, you know, 20, it takes, well, 20 hour days, although I certainly work those. But mm-hmm. it certainly, you know, it takes a good 15, 16 hour days to do it. And a lot of schmoozing and a lot of networking. And, yeah. I mean, your whole life is 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 this. That that is to say that it, it is a job that you really have to put your whole life into, mm-hmm. not just to get the job, but also once you have the job. Yeah. Um, but um, anyway, so I decided to go back, and I was uh, the head. I you know I worked for the head of the company, and. Um, it was fine. I mean, you know, we worked. Up, <laughs> I worked with people there like uh, Charlie Sheen. <laughs> this mm-hmm. was interesting. Uh, this was before he got right before he got two and a half men. Yeah. Um, and uh, he was taking jobs just to make money, mm-hmm. and just to pay the pay whatever bills. I don't know what bills they were, but <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> he was taking jobs just to make money. Um, Farrah Fawcett, mm-hmm. uh, obviously. Uh, long before she passed away, um, and some writers and some, you know, directors and stuff like that. And, you know, I mean, it was a medium sized company that's really blown up. And from that experience, I, a lot happened. Um, mm. I stayed there for, for a while. I really realized that management was what I wanted to do. I was, you know, involved in ways that I had never quite been involved as a, as, you know, in the agency side. Um, although I did work for people who were very strong, you know, close to their clients and mm-hmm. they didn't just sort of treat them like a name, mm-hmm. um, which can happen at agencies. And now that it's, agencies have become so big, you know, I mean, how many people can you really pay attention to? Right. Um, which is why I think management is so important. And management companies are now have, getting to the point where they're getting so big, too, that they're rivaling the size of agencies, which is sort of not the point. Um, Mm -hmm. in fact, it's, it's, it's not the point at all. You know, you have a couple, you know, and they're very good companies, obviously. Um, but you know, they can't give the attention that they need. I mean, the point of management has always been that you give personal attention to someone's career and Mm. probably life, um, you know, that goes along with it, but that you're there to help shape the career and manage it where an agent is really out there soliciting for jobs um, and you're there to take care of the client. And, you know, when you, you know, when your company is as big, almost as big as an agency, it's kind of hard to, uh, you know, to do that for every client. Um, So that's something that's happening in the management world, which is, you know, I mean, I know it's a topic of conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not stopping those companies from succeeding greatly, but I don't know about the attention that pe- you know people are getting there. Is yeah. is, the, is exactly what what they need, which is probably why you know being an uh, an assistant at a company like that is is probably a really great thing to do. Um, if you really want to be a manager, because you're going to get a lot of uh, one-on-one time with clients mm. that you might not have gotten. Uh, you know, in ways before. Um, anyway, from there, yes, I uh, I went. I actually got a job at a, at another management company. I had to leave immediately because <laughs> it was a rival management company. But it was a better. But it was a place where I there was a I felt there was a real future, and there was. Um, and that was Handprint Entertainment, mm-hmm. which is no longer around. But at the time, represented was a branding company, which is something I was very interested in, in branding clients, mm-hmm. um, working with people like brands, like Jennifer Lopez, like Will Smith, like uh, P. Diddy, Puff Daddy, or whoever he is these days, like uh, Mariah Carey, like uh, Tyra Banks, and, 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 and so many others. And they, and they were all, you know, it was a music company, it was uh, acting and writing and, you know, production. And, um, you know, by 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 those names, you know who they are. You mm. know what you're getting when yeah. you when you get a P. Diddy or a J. J. Lo or whatever. Um, and uh, that's something that I had become really interested in. 
And that and that's pretty interesting because I've I've had a lot of conversations with writers about the the personal branding thing, mm -hmm. and it it runs a, a pretty wide gamut because there's there's the personal branding inside the industry, which mm -hmm. is um, when I talk to Joe Agent, he he wants to know what I do, um, mm -hmm. and and if I've clearly defined what I right. can do, it makes it easier for him to sell me. But then there's also the the personal branding outside the the right. the industry people, and that's yeah how how people perceive you and that's more what you're speaking about well that's that's what i that's something that i was very interested in mm -hmm. and but it's something that you know mo mostly you see with performers like i mentioned now i i have worked with performers as i've said and i you know i've done so um you know until not that long ago mm -hmm. but but now that you bring you know touching on writers you know when i'm working with a client who is uh, a development client, somebody who hasn't been, you know, produced and is, you know, already established in their business and, you know, is known and getting offers and so mm -hmm. on. And I will take on, you know, a few of those every year or every, you know, six months or whatever, depending on, really depending on if I find great material from them. I, you know, if I find great material from somebody, I, I'm willing to, put in the work, of course. I mean, that's my job, you mm -hmm. know, in introducing them to the industry um, based on, you know, on their product. But it's very important that they be branded. Right. Um, and branded, I don't mean, you know, it does sound like cattle, of course, <laughs> but I, kinda, I, what I'd like to call it is pigeonholed. Mm. It's important as much as you don't want to be pigeonholed and that you know that you can write comedy and drama and thrillers and sci-fi and all this stuff is, you know, know and trust that you will have the time to do that. And and go ahead and write it if you need mm. to. Do what you need to do. But for the first couple of scripts that I go out with with you, I'm going to stick to one genre. And I'm right. going to skip the one that I think is the strongest for you and that your past work or whatever you've done before you've gotten to me, whatever, if you've won awards or if you've, you know, done this or whatever, whatever's happened, um, best, best suits you. I tell that to every client that I'm definitely going to pigeonhole you. The town needs you to be pigeonholed so that as they get to know you, they start thinking, I have an open assignment, you know, at, uh, Universal, you know, we need a, a thriller writer. Oh, you know, Joe Smith. Hmm. I, I met him. And he wrote that great thriller. And they're not thinking, oh, you know, <laughs> Joe Smith, well, he wrote that comedy and he wrote a thriller. I don't know. You know, I'm not sure what he's really into. Mm. Um, you really need to be defined. And that's where a manager comes in over an agent, is that a manager is going to think like that. An agent's going to submit you for anything possible. If you did a, you know, obviously, if you've done a great comedy, I'll, so, I'll talk to somebody about your comedy. But I'm going to try and steer you in, in one direction um, for a little while, at least. And uh, go ahead. Yeah, it, it, and then that brings up something. Um, it I don't know how this started, but it seems like writers who want to break in, they have it ingrained in them that <laughs> they must have an agent. They must mm. have an agent. An agent is the thing that will get them this this career. Yeah. It's, it's almost like that's the breaking in point, getting right. an agent. And and to me, I've I've always held to the fact that, I mean, first of all, I. I, I feel like we can be our own entre entrepreneurs and find our own opportunities. And that if I find an opportunity, an agent's going to come calling. Um, but it's what it sounds like you're saying, and which I, I think totally makes sense, is that it would be far wiser for somebody breaking in to, to hook up with a manager. And the manager would help them career-wise far better than an agent might at that point. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've pretty much done my coffee house spiel. Um, <laughs> uh. Coffee spiel. Um, you know, I, I, one of, I do, this is a great area for me to touch on because it is something I, you know, uh, I do feel strongly about. I, you know, I have, I have a bunch of clients with agents and that's great. That's great help for me and, you know, the resources that I can, I have access to with the agencies and, you know, especially if they're, um, if they're TV writers, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes time for staffing and all that kind of stuff, can't be an agency. Absolutely. Yeah. I've worked a lot with, I, I spent a lot of time in the UK and one of the things that I did, 
uh, when I came back from the UK was skew my business, although I don't do this anymore, though I do have UK clients, but I, I put an, an emphasis on my business in breaking uh, UK clients into the UK, into the US, mm-hmm. which, which I, some of which I did fairly successfully and some, some didn't, you know, it's, it's very individual, you know, mm-hmm. how well they can adapt to sort of you know, US writing styles and stuff like that. And uh, so I've had a lot. Of, so I've I've spoken to a lot of people. Every everybody in the UK sends me people who want you know to break into the uh, to the US. And I have this conversation not with people just from the UK, but with you know new writers or writers who you know feel that they're at a point where you know they're looking obviously for representation. And yes, the gold standard has always been agencies hmm. because that's how it always was CAA you know this sort of mystical idea of you know what CAA was and you know Willie Morris for you know this long time agency and all of this stuff and getting an agent believe me if you are a young writer the worst place you can be is at CAA yeah it's the you will never hear from them again yeah. unless you're just you know have written like you know the next Star Wars yeah and certainly that's possible but like you know if you're just a good writer who needs to get read <laughs> mm-hmm. and needs to go out on meetings and so on let me tell you I have writers who have you know staffed on television shows who have written uh, movies that have been produced who cannot get an agent wow. right now. It is so difficult. I mean, and these are, like I said, I mean, these are writers who are working, yeah. writers. And there are, you know, first of all, they're back in the day, you know, and I'm only 43, but I started when I was 20 because, mm-hmm. you know, because I got that job at William Morris. So it's been half my career, you know, half my life. Yeah. They were a ton of agencies that, you know, ranged from places like CAA to small, much smaller ones. Um, and then there still are some small ones and medium sized ones. But now agencies are primarily, you know, these conglomerate things of CAA mm. and ICM partners, which has had a trillion, has been taken over a trillion times or merged a trillion times. Um, you know, UTA, uh, William Morris, which merged and merged and merged. So there are these huge entities. You know, and then there's APA and Gersh and Paradigm and, and still, I mean, they're still, you know, those are the places that you consider small agencies. And you just can't get into them on yeah. a lot of on a lot of levels, and you have to have everybody. You have to agree that they're going to sign this person. It's not like it used to be where somebody would say, "Okay, I'll sign them." You know, you have to have somebody on the TV side saying they're going to sign them, and someone on the film side so that they can best, you know, hmm. cover that client. And uh, if somebody on the TV side wants to sign them, and somebody on the film side doesn't. You don't get signed. Wow. It's not easy. People think that it's easy. Um, and clients of mine have been very discouraged and understandably. They're like, what's the problem? I've been yeah. on a TV show. I've just, you know, I've written eight episodes of a TV show. I've done, can't get them at an agent. Mm. It has nothing to do with their talent. So agencies ha- hold a, a sort of a dream. <laughs> you know, <laughs> some sort of dream factor, yeah. I think, for people who grew up you know, thinking about being represented by an agent and not knowing a lot about what managers do. Managers, and I'll just do it real quickly, so I'll do my spiel, Mm -hmm. is if you want attention um, and you need help getting into the business or you have some contacts and you're also an entrepreneur yourself, which I think is a very important Mm -hmm. um, aspect of, of, of being in this industry is that you don't just sort of plop down and let somebody do it for you. <laughs> You're doing it as a partnership. I and mean, yeah. that's how I like to manage, certainly. Um, some people I do it with, some people I don't. But, um, you know, you have to be out there hawking your wares, too. I mm-hmm. mean, you have to be your best, you know, you have to be your best salesperson. Yeah. So um, I, have, I have a smaller, I have about, 10 to 12 clients. Um, some are working and I don't need to continually work with them. Um, others, you know, I'm trying to sell their script or I'm developing television shows with them and we're trying to get jobs or we're getting offers and fielding whether or not we're going to do this or this or this. Um, an agent does not have the time because their list is so long and they don't know you very well mm-hmm. and your work very well. I have agents who've never read my clients' work. I know that for a fact. Wow. Embarrassing, but I know that they do it 
to represent them on name only. Right. They represent them because it's a name, because they know that it can fit them into a slot on the television show. Um, and, you know, on one level, God bless, they have me yeah. to read their work over and over, give notes, uh, set up meetings, and agencies will do that as well, but set up meetings, think outside the box, okay, things aren't clicking, where else can we go, how else can we turn this into, you know, who else can you meet who's going to understand who you are, um, mm. let's think, you know, not the usual suspects, let's go to, you know, this place, or this place, or this place, and that's and that's what I do, and I have to do it for every different client, every client is different, and so I have to have a game plan for every client. Agencies don't have game plans. There's mm. no game plan. All they know is, you know, I have for television, they'll say, you know, okay, I have a, a female upper level producer mm -hmm. who writes, you know, um, comedy. Yeah. Great. That's that's who you are to them. That's it. To me, you, you know, you also want to write drama, so we're working on that. And maybe we're introducing you to some of the drama people at the networks and at the studios. We're, you know, you're wanting to segue from single camera to, um, you know, to multi camera. So we're working on that, and we're this, and we're that, and all of this stuff. And same with, you know, I mean, I'm talking about television, but you know, obviously the same with film. And with film, is where the where the pigeonholing comes in a lot more. Mm -hmm. So. It's very hard to get an agent. If you could get an, if you can get an agent, great, mm -hmm. get one. I mean, <laughs> all power to you. And and um, you know, and and it, I'm I'm always relieved when I can get a client an agent because it does take some of the pressure off of me mm -hmm. um, to you know have this person's life livelihood in my hands. But as you said, you know that person's livelihood has to be in their hands too. Yeah. And that is a big part of you know committing to a you know, trying to break into Hollywood or having a career in Hollywood. Yeah. Well, it, it just logistically, um, if if I had an uh, a manager and an entertainment lawyer, um, I could work for twenty years without an agent. Yes, you could. You can. You can do that. And I do have. I have a lot of a lot. I have several clients who who have that. Um, Listen, the great thing about an agency, and I, and I don't knock them, they, they have, you know, as I said, they have a great role. It's just that it's very hard to break in there. And mm -hmm. once you're in there, sometimes you forget you're there because it really doesn't <laughs> affect you, um, except when, when you need them. And then mm -hmm. you have to call them and explain everything that's been going on uh -huh. so that they can help. Um, but, um, you know, they're not on a day, day, you know, day to day base business with you, mm. um, you know, unless you're, you know, a huge star, and and on, on that level, you know, most, you know, to be to be honest, most actors have have managers. Most major, you know, Brad Pitt, Angelina, they all have managers. Mm -hmm. uh, they have agents, of course, who do their deals, and and you know, but um, they have managers um, managing their career. There's too much going on for for their agencies to be able to take care of. Yeah. So. Um, Yes, a, 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 here's the thing. A manager cannot negotiate, you know, truly negotiate for you. They can kind of put out a, uh, a very vague, you know, idea of what, mm -hmm. you know, they can quote, give you quotes and they can kind of push you in, you know, push you in a direction with a producer on negotiation. But once anything gets serious, you have to bring in a, uh, a lawyer. And if you have an agent, you need to bring in a lawyer too. It used to be that there used to be a whole system set up in agencies of mm -hmm. business affairs, which were your kind of personal lawyers once you got a job. But now, you you know, um, that's really not the case as much mm. anymore. They're there to sort of help, but everybody needs an attorney. Yeah. Um, so the agent is, you know, yes, can, can negotiate, but it's really the attorney who's going to end up doing your deal anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, whoever found it for you, whether it be your agent or your manager, is going to be, you know, cons consulted um, and, you know, and part of the, you know, part of the discussion with the, with the buyer. Um, but yes, a lot of people do it based with just a manager and a, and a, and a, um, an attorney, and um, you know, it, it, it works just fine. Listen, an agent. The great thing about agencies is that it's a bastion of information. Mm. All of the information comes in through an agency and it gets doled out. Um, so you need a manager who has good contacts with agencies, good contacts. But not just with agencies, but, you know, with the people that the agencies are getting the information from. I mean, you can work as a manager in the same way that agents work. 
in getting the information, um, you know, from them, what's going on, what's open, what's what their needs are, you know, what they're looking for, what's, you know, what are people looking for over at, you know, Warner Brothers these days, you know, and this and that, and, you know, uh, putting together with producers. And, you know, if you have an, a, a, a manager who isn't there just to, you know, make sure that your dry cleaning is picked up, um, you know, which is also something that <laughs> managers get involved in in uh-huh. some ways at times, um, then, you know, you have someone who is just as good as an agent. I mean, Angelina Jolie, I was going to say that she doesn't have an agency. There are people, Jack Nicholson um, has had an agent one agent, a small agent for since the beginning of his career, same person. Wow. And there are people who just have managers, like you said. I mean, big people who, you yeah. know, just like, I don't need an agency. Bill Murray, I think. Uh, yeah, possibly. Yeah. I mean, I remember Harrison Ford. Mm-hmm. Uh, his his manager passed away a couple of years ago, but he I don't think he's ever had an agent. Wow. But, you know, and he's Harrison Ford. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, and and granted, once you become Harrison Ford, you don't, you know, you, you you know, it doesn't matter who's calling, yeah. who who they call, they're calling. But um, listen, if you want to break in and you need somebody to put, take the time to introduce you to Hollywood, you want a manager. Hmm. That's who a manager is. And you want to know how many clients they want, they have and you want to talk to them about what their plan is for you. Hmm. Um, and, 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 I, and that's what I always discuss with potential clients is that I have a plan for each of you. You know, plan for, you know, Joe is not the same as plan for Steve. It's mm. just a different because you're different writers, because your experience is different, because your writing is different, because it's going to appeal to different people, because you potentially have one of you potentially has a career also in television and one of you may not. Um, you know, one of you might want to, you know, wants to direct at one point and the other doesn't. I mean, everybody's different and everybody's, you know, you're going in differently. Some write different, you know, somebody might be writing some big, you know, tentpole kind of movies. And obviously, you know, you're going to treat them differently than somebody who writes a Sundance film. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's a perfect segue to um, some questions that were submitted. And I've, I've had tons of questions asked about what you look for in a, in a new writer. And, and this could be new, meaning they've, they've written a whole bunch of scripts, right. but they just haven't broken into the industry yet. So, so somebody like that walks in your door. What are you looking for? Well, I'm going to be honest. That has changed over the years, mm-hmm. and um, it's changed you know, because the industry has changed. There used to be a lot of room for the small Sundance films because there were a lot more independent companies out there. Mm-hmm. Now the independent companies are these huge, they're independent, but they're these huge uh, financing companies, you know, yeah. that co-finance with the studios. And it's very hard to find, you know, the smaller uh, distribution, you know, production distribution companies like, I mean, this is really dating, but like places like October and, you know, Sony Classics used to be much bigger. And so you don't have as much opportunity for those kind of places. And you really have to, you know, find, um financiers in a way that, you know, the bottom sort of dropped out of that market, uh, I think, along with, you know, kind of things that happened on Wall Street um, that were funding a lot of, you know, smaller uh, entertainment possibilities. So the answer to that question is, first and foremost, a good writing is good writing. I mean, mm-hmm. that is it. You know what? I... I have this terrible thing called integrity <laughs> in this business, which has gotten yeah. me <laughs> into a lot of trouble at times, yeah. which is I cannot bullshit around the script that I know is not good. Mm-hmm. I can't do it. I have to sell it. I have to sell something with passion. I have to know. I have to really let people know that I believe in you as, mm-hmm. as a client. And I, I've just had so many experiences with good clients, bad clients, and we can get to what that means later. But the writing has to be good. And it mm. has to be something I really think is great writing and I feel passionate about. Um, I also, of course, as I learned and I, I mentioned, have to make a living. This is yeah. not just about writing a play and seeing it put up, you know, in front of 20 people. It has to be something where there's, you know, a living involved. I used to do a lot more smaller films or smaller scripts mm-hmm. um, because I think my general interest is, you know, smaller stories and, and, you know, more intimate stories. 
And uh, I do have a couple of those that I still, um, you know, a couple of writers who tend to write in that way. And there might be a special script that we have that we're, you know, we're still chipping away, working on with 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 financiers or trying to get an, an actor attached and stuff like that. And there's different ways, you know, of getting attention to scripts like that. But first and foremost, it has to be good writing. I mean, you can't write a big action film that's just crap. I mean, unfortunately, I guess you can, but I'm not the manager for you um, in, the, in that case. I mean, um, I, my experience is that I go with my gut, and my gut has actually not been wrong. Um, and I will not send a client script out until I really believe it's ready. Mm. I don't care if you think it's ready. I don't care if your friend, your roommate thought it think, thinks it's ready. Um, if I don't think it's ready... I'm not going to send it out. And I've, my experience has been that even with big scripts where, you know, you know, they're, they're genres pictures and, you know, you know, they're not small, tiny, you know, um, indie, indie films, but they're big films. When I've sent them out kind of just because I felt pressured or, um, you know, I, I just did for whatever reason, it hasn't worked. It doesn't matter if, if, you know, it was a film that Tom Cruise would attach himself to or, or Brad Pitt. Uh, if the script is not ready, I won't send it out, mm. um, no matter what. So the writing is what comes first. Right. And, of course, you have to, there has to, as time has gone on, the need for the ability to write a commercial film. It doesn't mean that that's all you write, because your passion might be your small little film that you mm. one day want to get made. Uh, well, one day we will we'll make that film. But first, we're going to make you some money and, <laughs> and me some money yeah. and we're going to get you known. Which was your process anyway. Yeah, I mean, that, that's something you yeah. learned very early. That's something I learned very early. Yeah. And let's get you, let's get you established. And then, you know, you can write that smaller film. Um, yeah. But first let's, you know, let's break you in with a, with a commercial thriller or commercial comedy or, or whatever it is. Hmm. Well, just um, because it was asked and I, th I think I know the answer already, but uh, <laughs> My Michael asks, what if a writer or screenwriter does not have a full length novel or screenplay um, but he's got pitches hooks and log lines to die for or let, let's put it in there say say he he's written a one-act play that's the best one you've ever seen but he's got nothing else no mm -hmm. I, I hate to say no but here's the thing pitches are very hard unless you have unless you are known mm -hmm. already people know who you are or you have somebody attached to it now so if it's the best pitch in the world and we can, based on it being the best pitch in the world or it being the best, you know, partially something, mm -hmm. get a producer attached to it who has, you know, the right contra contacts and, you know, will actually take you along for that ride. Mm -hmm. It's possible. That is such a blue moon happening yeah. thing. Um, you know, unfortunately, what's happened in this industry, especially in the um, in the television industry, is that it's all about, you know, it's funny, television used to be where you go to die after <laughs> you've been a movie star, and now yeah. it's all movie stars, and it's yeah. all filmmakers, and it's crowding out, you know, the younger creators of television shows or one, you know, or pictures. You know, I have clients who, again, are well-established and who have run television shows who are trying to sell on pitches, and it's very difficult. Hmm. You really need to have a very strong, you know, uh, solid attachments if you're going to do pitches there's no reason why you shouldn't be finishing a project i mean right. i don't know why you wouldn't do that in the first place i mean you can't really sell anything without knowing how it ends <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> you know i yeah. mean without knowing who you, and finishing the arcs of the characters and i mean that's that's a shortcut that i'm not interested in in getting involved with yeah. I'm not interested in people who, who you know, who just want to get in the door the best, the quickest way possible. Yeah, yeah, because and 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 it just makes sense because you have to add to that pitch. Yeah, of course. Basically, saying um, this is my great idea, and I <laughs> should add the excellent partner to this is the fact that I've never finished anything. Right, and and how do I know you can, you know? So you're an idea person, and some yeah. people are idea people, and that and that is great. And if you can write, then you're you're going to be a star. But if you're an idea person and you can't write, then you should go into advertising. <laughs> yeah. 
to be honest. <laughs> yeah, and and Howard asks a slightly more cynical question, but it might be might be an interesting thing to talk about. Um, mm-hmm. Howard actually worked in a in a place where he read tons of scripts, and he saw mm-hmm. some bad and mediocre mm-hmm. writers getting representation, and yeah. some good writers getting passed. Um, yeah. How would that happen? I don't know how it happens. Listen, there are a lot of bad movies out there that make a lot of money. Um, mm-hmm. Bad writers who write commercial horror films mm-hmm. can get representation probably the easiest than anybody. Mm-hmm. Because there's a need, because there's a glut of a need for horror films, or mm-hmm. desire, I should say, for horror films. You can Because they're so easy and cheap. To make most of the time, and you don't need stars most of the time, and you can sell them worldwide without any like, oh, that comedy doesn't translate in China or mm. you know the UK comedy, whatever. Horror is horror is horror, and I, I would I would bet that those are um, horror films or really high action films, mm. um, really strong like action films that again will translate. Um, internationally. That's where an agency is going to look and see, oh, I can sell this, you know, immediately. We can set this up with a sales agent or I can sell this to, I don't want to name a studio that might do that because I think that's changed a lot, but to, you know, X producer or X studio who I know is just grinding out these things. Mm -hmm. And yes, of course, some some people, uh, you know, just get a break. You just get that break and it's hard to understand and it's distressing and disturbing and there you are you know really talented writer who's not getting the movie made or getting representation and you know joe schmo who you know just had a great idea um and you know wrote well enough Mm -hmm. got him got a man got an agent or or manager does happen i mean sir of course it does but it it it, it, it's not gonna it's it's gonna be in in a in a much uh you know, more widespread kind of genre. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it is what it is. It's what, it's, it's what keeps a lot of studios going. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, is there home, you know, video departments and their international departments and selling internationally and stuff like that. But, uh, I would, I would venture to say that that's, that's what it's about. It's, it's those genres. It's action adventure and it's horror where you, you can do it cheap um and you can do it in foreign places where you can get huge tax cuts mm. and um you don't need movie stars so you can put them together real not slapdash in a horrible way but really quickly without you know having to keep submitting to big movie stars and getting turned down based on the uh, quality of the material but people understanding that people are just going to go see this and they're going to rent it and they're going to mm. take it off on demand and they're going to you know Netflix yeah. it and all that stuff well, and and the question behind that question that I'm hearing anyway is uh, I'm writing good writing. Why don't I have representation yet? And I I would say if that person is writing good writing and keeps writing good writing, yeah, they'll get they'll eventually get it. I, I do think that that's true. And and you know, listen, I, getting representation is hard, and and this is a hard business. And and I'm gonna just stress what I said in the sort of in the beginning. You really have to take control of your career. Hmm. That means you have to go to schmoozy networking things. You have to join writers groups. Maybe you're in a writer's class. I know writers who, you know, write and are produced and, you know, are working who continue to go to writing classes to work, you know, to really get a script right. So you're, you're, in, you're meeting people, you know, take a course you know, take a one night course or seminar thingy at UCLA Extension or at Writers Boot Camp, all of these places. Get to know other writers. Get to know, you know, get into groups where you're meeting producers, where you're meeting agents, where you're meeting, you know, people that you need. They need you just as much as you need them. They need product as much as you need somebody to, you know, sell your product. So, Really, the most important thing that you can do, other than write well and continue to write, don't stop writing. It just cramps your thought, you know, just cramps your writing, you know, vibe. Hmm. Is um, is to get out there and as horrible as some of it is, or it's not your style of doing, just try and and get those contacts. That contact will eventually 
pay off in some way, whether it's through them or they send it to a manager and it's, the, you know, not the right manager or it is the right manager, but that manager sends it to somebody else or says, hey, you know, somebody, this is somebody up your alley. I think you're going to like this kind of person. Um, you know, there are clients, you know, that I turn down or that I let go because they're not working in the way that I work and, you know, then it's interfering. Not that everybody has to work exactly how I work, but it has to work, has to, has to, has to work for us. Um, we have to be, work together well. You know, it really is about who you know, and that's going to get you somewhere. It mm-hmm. is definitely going to. It's get, like I said, you know, I worked on desks for I don't know how long, like six years. Mm-hmm. I mean, I started young, but for six years before I became a, a full manager, I was a junior manager, and blah, 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 you know, and I was still doing assistant work and you know, had a couple of clients on the side, and then I finally, you know, was making enough money for the company that I was a manager. It takes a long time. I mean, it's just a process. You know, sometimes it happens quickly. You know, like mm-hmm. I said, it just, you know, you feel a need that that's at a company and you're in. But a lot of that has to do with, you know, the fact that you're, you know, you're hustling. So yeah. it's a hugely competitive, a hugely competitive uh, industry. You have to take control of your career and you have to get out there and meet people and just say, can I buy you a cup of coffee, you know, to a manager or to a friend? Can you please introduce me to a manager, have them read this and I'll just buy them a cup of coffee and, you know, even just pick your brain and you just never know where things are going to go. And if you're a smart manager and you're looking for clients or, you know, you're looking for good material, you'll read because you never know what you're going to find. I mean, I've read clients off of like Twitter Mm-hmm. You know, who, who will come to me and, you know, say, can, would you please read this? And I've read it and it's been great. Wow. I mean, who, and, and I've gone on to, to, to represent them. Wow. But, I mean, that's the difference of today. You know, I mean, you never had social networking the way you do now and you have to use it. Mm. You really do. And, and managers and agents and so on, or certainly managers have to be willing to, to know that there may be a diamond in the, you know, in that stack of, crappy stuff that you get halfway through before you throw in the trash or whatever, that there, there might be a great film in there yeah. or the potential for one. The, uh, the example that comes to mind is that if every farmer just planted one seed, we'd yeah. be in big trouble. <laughs> they're, they're looking for the best <laughs> seeds that they can, and they're yeah, working exactly. really hard to plant as many of them as they can. Yeah, you got to write. I mean, you got to keep writing. You got to have a lot of different things for people to to read. I'll take that back. I have signed people off of one thing. Rarely Mm -hmm. is that a positive thing for me to do. Sometimes I get really excited about one project and I kind of negate the rest of what they've done or I just sort of dive in. Mm -hmm. But that hasn't always worked out well. It's really important that you, that you, you know, you have a portfolio of material and that you are working and that you're, that an agent or a manager or whomever, producer, sees that you are continually producing material that you are continually working or thinking about material or thinking about different ideas or research, you know, that you're working. I mean, this is your job, whether you're making money at it or not, you know, whether you're actually, you know, a waiter or whatever it is that you're doing while you're writing or working at Starbucks or whatever. I read the pilot of the guy who makes me my coffee, Uh you know, every morning. It was good. I mean, I didn't sign him, but I, I read it. I gave him notes. You know, I mean, he's got to keep, you know, it's his job to get up the nerve to ask me when I, you know, he says, what do you do? You know, to say, will you read this? I'm going to be a jerk. And I'll say no. I mean, of course, why not? Wow. I get a free cup of coffee out of it. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I well, didn't, by the way. Well, but, we're getting to the end of our time here, but that is yeah. actually a great place to end up um, yeah. and some great advice for people to really take to heart. Um, so your your company is High Street Management, and uh, and you're on Twitter. Um, how could people contact you if they wanted to get in touch? Twitter's great because I'm on there, and I you know I have a sort of established presence there. It's, I'm at uh, it's called it used to be High Street. It's called Trying True. Trying True. And or Jenny Frankfurt. Or Jenny probably Frankfurt. Easier easier to remember, and that's probably the best way to to reach me is through Twitter. Or you can, if you're going to write, uh, let me just give you a really, really quick piece of advice on the tail end of this. Mm-hmm. You know, my I will send out my email, which is jenny at highstreetmanagement.com. Mm-hmm. That's not hard to find because it's on my IMDb yeah. page and my client's IMDb pages. You know, invest in something like that is pretty important. 
yeah. something like IMDb, um, which, you know, is an investment, costs you a little bit, it's important. Don't write me a standard letter. Write a letter to me. <laughs> any Frankfurt. Don't write a yeah. letter that is cut and paste and doesn't have any personal element to it. Yeah. You don't have to know me to know how to write a letter that makes me think that you might know me. Yeah. Um, people who just cut and paste, I, I rarely, I could say almost never, 99.9% just delete. You got to do your work. Mm-hmm. You got to know who you're writing to. You got to look at the clients and see what kind of people I represent and know whether or not you're going to fit into that place. I mean, just like you wouldn't send a small comedy to Michael Bay and, yeah. and um, you know, who makes huge, big, you know, action films. And by the same token, you know, if you send just sort of your random uh, email to, uh, you know, a manager, it just, you know, it, it, it it's, it's good to kind of get an idea of, of who they are before mm. you just attack, you know, well, not attack, but, you know, uh, submit, you know, attack them with your email. Just as if I'm going to go as your manager to an agent on your behalf, I'm going to choose one that I know is going to be the right style for you. This is your job to know who is who and what, who, you know, who likes what and Mm. who's going to, you know, who's going to be more receptive and responsive to your material. Um, That's just, you know, and if obviously if you get in just because you got an in, you know, that you should definitely take it. But if you, you know, unsolicited material is a whole, you know, conversation in itself. But if you are going to do it unsolicited, you know, do it, do it as personally as you can. Mm. Um, because I don't have time to read 60 scripts a week like I could if I, if, you know, if I, if I responded to every, you know, unsolicited impersonal email I got. Mm. You know, where the fonts are all different, and you know, my name is misspelled. And, you know, like do it right. Yeah. To whom it may concern. It right. Yeah, to whom it may concern, dear sir. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, well you, anyway. you, you've been very generous with your time. It was my pleasure. And uh, and thank you so much. And it definitely best of luck to you. Thank you. And, and to everyone out there. Cool. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Nate. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web. 